Thank you for downloading this episode of Case Notes. Case Notes was recorded at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. Visit our website to find out about our latest events. And please support us and help us to reach new audiences by liking, following, or leaving a comment on whatever podcast platform you are listening on. We hope you enjoy the talk. So, hello. Um, yeah, my name's Matt. Um, uh, just a quick uh, trigger warning, or content notice at least. Uh, male nudity and uh, images of preserved human remains. I did forget once giving this talk to a WI at 11 o'clock in the morning to take the <laughs> male nudity out. They loved it, actually. I didn't really mind it. Um, so, um, I'm a historian of tattooing, primarily, and... Um, People always ask me kind of what got me into tattooing in the first place. And um, some of you may have heard me tell this story before. But um, I, when I was a kid, I got told two stories, one of which was about my, from my granddad, who had been a submariner in the Dutch Navy during uh, World War II. And he told me once that he woke up drunk in a tattooist's chair in Jakarta in the Dutch East Indies um, as he was about to have a fly tattooed on the end of his nose. Um, and he woke up just in time, thankfully, and um, you know took that as a kind of cautionary tale. As an aside, by the way, I told that story on um, uh, Australian radio a few weeks ago, and I got an email from a guy who was a retired naval captain. He said, "Your granddad told me that story too in 1967." So, um, so that was good. It was good to get some validation for that story. The other, half of that, the other half of the story intended to warn me off getting tattooed was um, from my grandma. My grandma was English. Her mother um, was born in Kent um, uh, to a labourer called Samson Darby. Her name is, uh, or was, Ethelwyn Darby. Uh, she is on the... Oops, do that. It's too laser pointer. There we go. Ooh, where were we? Yeah, there she is. So my great-grandma. Um, and uh, the, the story, her, her kind of don't get tattooed story, uh, basically was her brother came home one day with a tattoo machine that he got from somewhere, and said, hey, big sister, can I tattoo you? Uh, this is probably about 1900, maybe slightly after. And said, uh, hey, little sister, uh, hey, big sister, can I tattoo you? Uh, and she said, will it come off? And he said, yes. <laughs> um, uh, and so for the rest of her life, she had her initials uh, ED, Ethelwyn Darby, tattooed on her wrist. And obviously didn't like it very much. Um, so in a sense, my... T- research and my talks and my writing and stuff is a way to kind of reconcile those two stories like the familiar one the drunken sailor story i think we can all kind of understand that as a um you know as a kind of we try to conjure up an image of tattooing in the past the drunken sailor in the asian seaport easily comes to mind but i think the story of a tattooed young woman or a a teenage girl in turn of the century britain done with a machine that was somehow available to a non-professional young boy um, it's harder to make sense of. Um, and so, in a way, this is kind of the, uh, what I try and do, join the dots up between the things that we know, or think we know at least, about tattooing, and these things that are revealed in personal stories and in private archives and in the tattoo community and in, in kind of the deeper sort of recesses of institutional memory about what tattooing might have looked like um, outside of those standard stories of the tattooed sailors. Um, so I was really pleased to discover, because I, you know, where did my great uncle Billy, as a child of about 15 maybe, get a tattoo machine from? Because, you know, it's hard to imagine where about 100 years ago a young teenage boy may have got such a thing. And I was very pleased to find out you could buy them in toy shops. <laughs> well, it's really a toy shop. There was a, um, a department store called Gamages in London. A uh, big department store, kind of the equivalent of a you know, Debenhams or House of Fraser or something. They sold everything from bikes to sporting goods, clothes, um, magic, uh, cy- uh, all, all cycles, all kinds of stuff. And they also had a, 
um, a line of electrical novelties. Um, and basically for a few years at least, around about 1910 through to about the beginning of the First World War, they sold over-the-counter tattoo machines. Um, initially as electrical novelties alongside light-up buttonholes. I don't show up, show those images because they've got some racist caricatures on them. But um, after a few years, as quite quotidian professional equipment alongside... Uh, telephones and uh, telegraph machines. Because basically the technology to make them work is the same. You need an um, uh, electromagnet that makes a bar go up and down like that. Um, that's the what's inside a telephone, it's what's inside a doorbell, uh, it's also what's inside a tattoo machine. And so the fact that, you know, a tattoo machine like this uh, was available to a young child uh, or a teenage boy to go and buy over the counter with a few pence um, I think automatically or, or straight away start shifting our sense of what we think we know about tattoo history. Because this is, um, if not exactly mainstream, it's certainly available, it's public facing, um, it's perhaps even older than we might imagine. So um, these kind of stories, which work against the things we think we know about tattooing, who had tattoos, when they got them, why, um, all of those kind of questions are put into much more complex relief when we start looking at some of the material culture and some of the archive sources, which, is, which have been beyond the kind of thing that academics has normally looked at. Um, you know, even things like this, like uh, one of the things I think um, you know, we work against, as I said, we may have heard, or you may have heard this idea that like, only sailors used to get tattooed, or only criminals used to get tattooed, or oh my god, women are getting tattooed now. It's so trendy. Um, here's a um, lovely wayward young French uh, girl um, getting tattooed in a park uh, in uh, the 1890s. And like, this is like the most, she, this woman is the most French person I've ever seen. <laughs> Smoking a fag, playing cards. Ah, oh, but get tattooed in the park. Um, um, uh, and this idea of tattooing is a kind of moral panic. You know, oh my God, women are getting tattooed now. You'll see it in the, in the Daily Mirror and the Sun and stuff and on, on, on TikTok even today. Um, but this starts a long time ago, you know. Um, and the other thing I, I work against uh, is this idea that tattooing is something alien to European history. Um, or particularly the idea that tattooing was discovered in the Pacific. Um, that before the encounters with uh, Tahiti and Fiji and New Zealand and Samoa and other cultures in um, Polynesia and Micronesia, tattooing was kind of unknown or at least perhaps in the more nuanced versions forgotten to European history. Um, and that somehow we imported it back from elsewhere. Um, this is just one example. I sort of picked this at random, and it's a kid's book, which I so it's a good, um, a recent kid's book, which is an example of just how deep this goes. You know, you can see um, Maori warriors with elaborately tattooed faces come out, come out in their canoes to greet you. Tattooing is new and strange to you. After they discover how it's done, it becomes popular with British sailors. No. Um, so, as we'll see... Um, Actually, the exact opposite is true. Um, British sailors knew how to tattoo already, and when they saw how New Zealanders did it, they did absolutely nothing different at all. Um, the impact of Pacific tattooing on European tattooing is precisely nothing. Um, and we'll go into those histories today. Um, okay. Um, so I, I'm not going to go into the real deep histories today, the real prehistoric histories. Um, as Daisy kindly pointed out, I do have a book out. Um, it's coming out in, it's out in hardback at the moment. It's coming out in paperback in two weeks at the end of September. Uh, tell your friends. Um, so you can, you can buy copies of it for Christmas. I do tell the stories of, um, amongst others, these two tattooed women from, uh, tattooed people from history. Um, on the left here, Otzi the Iceman. Um, a Bronze Age uh, or uh, late Copper Age, really, man from um, the modern-day region of Tyrolia on the border between Italy and Austria, who was tattooed, or who lived, and I suppose was tattooed about five and a half thousand years ago, the oldest preserved piece of human skin we have, and no, on a European body. Um, and for example, this woman here, uh, who's called uh, Otshibala, um, the Altai or um, Uruk princess from a cultural group called the Pazaric, um, who live, uh, lived in the Altai region of Siberia um, about 300 years BCE, so about 2,000, 2,500 years ago, um, who's covered in these amazing elaborate tattoos. And there's quite a few mummies from her culture that have been discovered, uh, all of which, so far, both men and women, have these kind of mystical, animalistic tattoos. So 
Um, basically, and I'm simplifying a lot here, but pretty much every human culture we've discovered um, thus far seems to have some kind of body modification technology, largely tattooing. And tattooing appears to date about the same as the beginning of modern humans, so about between 45 and perhaps even 100,000 years ago. Um, but I want to talk more specifically about um, uh, the kind of storytelling that I was just alluding to, right? This idea about how tattooing connects us in modern day Europe to our past. And essentially, um, far from tattooing being forgotten or, or, or not known about or discovered in the Pacific, uh, in the 16th century, um, and certainly even earlier, the idea that tattooing was an important part of European cultural history was well known. Um, so some of you may have heard about the Picts, uh, who were um, uh, a group of, uh, a tribal grouping from Scotland or from Caledonia. Um, sadly, actually, they probably weren't tattooed. Um, it's probably body paint rather than permanent tattooing. But whatever the archaeological truth of the matter, it certainly was the case that uh, Rome, the Romans in particular, believed the Picts to have been permanently tattooed. Uh, in fact, the name for this country, Britain, um, perhaps comes from the proto-Celtic word for um, land of the painted people. So um, when um, Europeans started encountering uh, tattooed people on the eastern seaboard of the American continent, so in places like modern-day Canada, uh, modern-day Florida, for example, and encountering people with tattoos, they recognized these marks from accounts that they'd read in basically fabulated Roman sources. Um, they've been reading for centuries about, from, in Roman sources about tattooing uh, in the ancient uh, British Isles. And so this image uh, was one of those produced by a guy called John White, who was an artist working in about the 1570s, uh, of an ancient Pictish warrior. So it's based entirely on these uh, Roman sources. So he's got this kind of badass, like, owl chess piece here, um, you know, 600 years before his time. Um, all of these kind of imagined marks all over his body, um, cool snakes on his arm, all this kind of stuff. And these were published and, in fact, produced um, alongside images of native, tattooed native North Americans, uh, such as this woman from Florida, or indeed this woman from um, uh, Labrador on, in modern-day Canada who has these kind of traditional markings on her face that you can just about make out there. Um, and the story was, in the British imagination, like, we've encountered these people in the New World, these quote-unquote savages, um, but they're just like us. Like, your ancestors, educated British people, were just as weird as this a long time ago. So... <laughs> It's kind of a humanistic story about the history of tattooing. It's a, it's a story which, in which tattooing connects human populations across time. And it's still basically racist because it implies there's this kind of timeline uh, and cultural uh, development, teleology, towards, uh, towards you know, modern European Christian culture, um, with modern European Christian culture being better. Um, so there's still a kind of problem, problematizing idea there, but the idea is that tattooing is something that connects us as human beings. Um, in times past, our people was just as savage as those in Virginia, said uh, a book in which these images were published. Um, so this woman, uh, again, I, I won't go into her story here today, but her story is told in my book as well. Her name's Arnak. Uh, she was the first female native North American to be brought to Europe. Um, and so this is about 200 years before Captain Cook. She was brought to London in uh, 1577. So 200 years before Captain Cook, we already knew about tattooing. Um, if we then skip forward into the 17th century, the 1600s, uh, we start seeing a much more visible history of tattooing on Europeans themselves. Um, for example, principally on pilgrims. So this guy, we don't know who he is, but um, you can see there he's holding his arm very boldly, and he has these tattoo marks on his arm. Um, so pilgrimage marks uh, became pretty standard uh, souvenirs of going to places like Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Nazareth, and also even pilgrimage sites in places like Loretto in Italy from about 1575. So again, uh, like 200 years before Captain Cook. Uh, we have, you know, um, on his arm here, this date, 1660-something, uh, we have, this is the floor plan of the Holy Sepulchre. 
Um, someone, when I showed this the other day, said that oh, it was an alien spacecraft, and it was proof that aliens had visited Britain before. <laughs> um, and the crown of King James. Uh, my point is not working. Um, nope, my point is not working. Hopefully my, yeah, that works. Okay. So uh, the crown of King James on the bottom of the wrist there. Um, this became, again, a pretty well-known story, um, and it was featured in many pilgrimage accounts, including, actually, uh, the story of a Scottish pilgrim uh, called William Lithgow, who had his pilgrimage tattoos done in 1612. Um, Jerusalem, at the time, was uh, run by the Franciscans, and so this Scottish Protestant shows up, and he says, yeah, I want the Jerusalem cross design, which is that same design that this guy has on his wrist, the, the symbol of Christianity coming out of Jerusalem. I also want to do this crown thing and put IR. And of course, the local tattooists in Jerusalem didn't know that that meant, uh, you know, long live King James and the Protestant King of uh, Scotland. And so when the Spanish Inquisition picked up Lithgow some years later when he was traveling in Spain, they were so outraged at this Protestant design next to their Catholic one that they put him on the rack and tortured, it, tortured him and then cut it off his wrist. <laughs> um, but all of which is to say we have this long-standing history of pilgrimage tattooing on European bodies, well-known, well-attested in the centuries before the Cook voyages. Um, here's another one. Um, sometimes I show this uh, to people and ask them to guess when it's from. Looks like it could be on a premiership footballer. <laughs> could be on David Beckham or something, but it's, on, um, it's actually on a, a pilgrim from that same period, from the, 16, uh, from the 1660s. This is actually a German pilgrim called uh, Ratke Stuber. And you can see on his arm here, um, he has this kind of narrative scene of Christ crucified, Christ risen, and Christ assumptive right the way up his arm. <clears throat> this is, uh, by this point, about 100 years before Captain Cook, 1669. Okay. Um, we also, you know, can find stuff a bit closer to home. Uh, and it's difficult, actually, but, but the places... Uh, we can look off, for example, things like this. This is um, from a what's called a gazette, a sort of newspaper published in the American colonies uh, in the early 1700s. So again, in about a few decades before Cook set foot in the Pacific. And it's essentially the, um, a kind of like lost and found, but for indentured servants. So you would, if your cook or your tailor or something ran away from your... Um, plantation, you would advertise, you know, have you seen my indentured servant? He's wearing, in this case, for example, breeches. Uh, let's see if we can do here. A pair of grey worsted stockings, a pair of dark green stockings, color, uh, uh, old coloured hats, etc, etc. And then things like this, right? What, on one of his arms is represented our saviour upon the cross between two thieves, and on the other, the image of Adam and Eve. Right, so this is, we don't have the word tattoo at this time. Uh, these are called things like prickings or markings. But this is 10 years before Captain Cook uh, goes to the Pacific. And we have clear evidence of kind of Christian style ink marking tattooing on um, a European uh, cook in this case. And there's a few of these. We also have um, records like this of like tattooing used or skin marking technology used in other contexts. This is also from Tyrol, um, just a story for, again from the 1740s about um, sending off children to work on the other side of the mountains and then they'd be away for so long that when they, when they came back they, you might not recognise them. So you tattoo them with your name on them like a kind of lost property tag <laughs> so that you know who they were when they came back. Right. Children, when young, mark some image on their arm with a needle or the point of a knife, and their, their marks being rubbed over with a particular, particular black ink they never wear out, but many years after, prove the means of evincing their consanguinity. Right, so we can figure out who was related to whom. So this is, this is knowledge of tattooing in the centuries and decades, and even years before Captain Cook. Um, the best one of these, though, is not just the uh, centuries or decades before Captain Cook, but literally the day Captain Cook set foot for the first time in Tahiti, this painting was on display in London at the Royal Academy. And again, I tell her story in much more detail in the book, but her name is Mikok. She is uh, an Inuit woman from uh, Labrador, again, from the, on the east coast of modern Canada. And um, she has traditional Inuit tattoo marks on her face. Um, far from um, 
therefore not knowing about tattooing at all, it must be the case that tattooing was kind of actively or at least kind of, um, you know, uh, to, to at least some people consciously removed from public discourse. And the story really is because um, we've known about Native North American tattooing for a, a couple of hundred years at this point, uh, actually nearly 300 years, but um, it was still going on despite Christian missionary attempts to wipe it out. And as the colonial project changed into the 18th century, as, for example, the colonial projects in the Pacific kind of ramped up, the storytelling, and, as, and this also goes a long time alongside things like scientific racism and scientific discourse, pseudoscientific discourse, social discourse about race, develops. We end up with a story not that tattooing is something that connects us, but that tattooing is something that divides us from one another. And so the tattoos on the Mori, on people in Fiji, people in uh, Indonesia, in the Philippines, people in uh, tattooed people all across uh, the Western Hemisphere, were, um, or of course the Eastern Hemisphere, were understood to be not just different from us, but in some cases even a different species of person. And so this storytelling, you know, the persistence actually of tattooing on people like Meacock, despite centuries of colonial attempts to wipe it out, is a bit of a problem for the colonial project because it kind of undermines the idea that, that Christianizing the world is, a, is, is something that's going to work very well. And so that, that's not, I'm not saying this is an active kind of cackling in a back room thing, but this is what's happening over discourse over a period of about 50 or 60 years. And in, certainly by um, the early 1800s, we're starting to see people thinking that you know, this tattooing stuff we've never seen before. Funnily enough, you know, Joseph Banks, who was um, Cook's science, science officer, who potentially uh, commissioned this portrait, or it certainly wasn't of the opinion that tattooing was discovered in the Pacific. He owned this book, uh, which, was about, which was about the habits of the Greenlanders of Inuit uh, up in the native north, native north uh, of the world. And this talks about um, thread blackened with soot drawn betwixt the skin of their chin and also their cheeks, hands and feet, which leaves a black mark behind when the thread is drawn away as if they had a beard. Um, so this is like the, the traditional technique of, uh, it's actually called kakinik, um, what some European explorers called kakining. And if we hadn't forgotten about tattooing, which is a word we do get from Tahitian, we might these days be talking about kakining rather than tattooing. But this is a traditional practice in, amongst um, Inuit women, um, pulling a blackened thread through the skin to leave a um, dot dash pattern. But yeah. So if, if anyone ever tells you that, that Captain Cook discovered tattooing in the Pacific, you can tell them that they're wrong. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, the, the facial tattooing that they did encounter, this is from uh, Sidney Parkinson, who was the draftsman ab aboard the first Endeavour voyage. Like, it, it, did make a, it did make an impact in the facial tattooing and the extent and the relationship of tattooing to its particular ritual context was very surprising to um, Cook and Banks and, and others on the voyage. But it's certainly not that the technology itself, marking of the skin with ink, was something new. And in fact, I say a lot, uh, it's been a bit, of a bit of a cliche of mine, that tattooing is a medium, not a phenomenon. Right? If you collapse all kinds of marking of the skin with ink as the same thing, you make or repeat uh, mistakes like this one. Um, rather than thinking that each, you know, each particular instance of tattooing has a particular context, has a particular set of social relations, has a particular set of histories and possibilities in its own right. Um, so, as I said, after the Pacific encounter in the 1760s and 70s, nothing much changes. And we can see, for example, on paintings like this one from um, the Palace of Westminster, the House of Lords, uh, commemorating the Battle of Trafalgar. Um, the painting was done in, in 1869. You can see the kind of tattoos here um, that are being shown. Boyfriends, uh, girlfriends' names, lovers' names, um, patriotic marks, all these kind of things, Christian imagery, are very similar in both in technique and in style to those that were described in the previous uh, gazettes that I showed you. Um, we don't see loads, I mean, we do see some, but we don't see loads of sailors coming home with mocha on their faces, right? They just carry on doing the same kind of thing they've been doing already. Um, 
And we can tell that actually it's hard in a way to, to figure out what tattoos look like uh, in this period because pre-photography, pre um, but we can find some preserved tattooed skin, for example, like this one, um, showing a, a mermaid here. This is like mid, mid 1800s. Um, and we can also compare it potentially with like handicrafts. So sailors were making things like, or it's, this is called a love token, scratching things into like worn off coins or sewing, darning, doing tobacco tins or scrimshaw you may have seen as well, the kind of whalebone. And the designs move very straightforwardly from tattooing onto these other objects. Tattooing is a quite straightforward part of sailor handicrafts in the Georgian period, right? Um, the problem with this, in a way, is that tattooing becomes associated very quickly with, like, for example, criminality. Because if you go to a museum or a library and archive and you look for evidence of tattooing, you will find it primarily in places where people whose bodies were recorded for history are to be found. And that is largely military people, naval men, soldiers, and criminals, people who just have their bodies recorded. Normal people's tattooing is not recorded for posterity. It hasn't been. So if you don't look beyond the sort of standard records, you may conclude, as many academics and historians have done over the centuries, that tattooing was only for sailors and criminals. But of course, loads of people who have tattoos are not sailors or criminals, and loads of sailors and criminals just happen to have tattoos. Um, again, I tell the story of this in the book in more detail, but this is about a, a supposedly fearsome tattooed gang called the 40 Thieves from eight, the 1820s and 30s, sort of Dickensian London, think kind of Oliver Twist, Fagan kind of era. And um, uh, every time someone with a tattoo mark on them was arrested, they were like, oh my God, they're part of the 40 thieves. They've got the mark of the 40 thieves upon them. Um, but actually, if you read these articles very closely, you'll notice that that mark seems to change every time it's reported. And um, it takes uh, this guy, who's one of my heroes. Uh, where is he? Ooh, no, I need this one. Um, there's this guy called uh, Waddington, who, uh, who is the jailer in uh, Hatton Garden. And he says, look, um, I've heard a great deal about the 40 thieves, but never knew of the existence of such a gang. It was all nonsense, right? Just some people have tattoos and, and are in, in gangs. Doesn't mean that they're all, they all know each other, <laughs> right? Um, unfortunately, these kind of mistakes are still made by the FBI and the Metropolitan Police even today, but good old Waddington figured it out in the 1820s. Um, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit, but um, the other thing that actually new records are, are, are helping us uncover is a more diverse history of tattooing. Um, for example, uh, tattooing on people of colour. And um, this is sort of really preliminary work, but for example, even if you look at these criminal records just as criminal records, you, with a bit more care, you start finding, for example, a perhaps a kind of you know, black uh, uh, British tattoo culture. So this guy, Thomas Ellis, who is in this record uh, set because it's a convict record set. So he, did, he was a criminal, but he was born in 1802 in Jamaica. He's a black man, but he's covered in badass sailor tattoos. He's got a clown tattoo. There we go, for example. Um, and so this is an example, kind of rare example, but an interesting example of tattooing of, on people of color as well. OK. Um, so. Um, I also wanted to talk about this specifically here in Scotland because um, it's a very particular story which relates to the, the, the place and, 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 and uh, culture that we're in here. Um, so tattooing, over the, because of this kind of criminology and this interest in you know, scientific racism, what can we tell about people from their bodies? What, how can we measure their heads and all this kind of stuff to figure out what kind of person they are? Tattooing became really of interest, particularly to pathologists who were just kind of just, if it came across your, your dissection desk, you cut it off, you keep it for yourself. And um, then you show it off to your mates later on. And so this is actually from an um, uh, anatomical society of Great Britain and Ireland, August uh, uh, 1892, the fourth quarterly meeting um, held in the Anatomical Theatre of the New Building in Edinburgh. Uh, a theatre probably a bit like this. And um, at that, these people showed off all the cool shit that cut off their patients recently. Um, 
So we have uh, antlers of a roe deer. Probably didn't Dick didn't get a lot of uh, clout for that, Mr. Bland Sutton. Um, that's sebaceous glands and antlers. Um, we also have um, a, that's pretty cool. Transposition of the viscera of an abdomen and thorax of the body of an old woman. Pretty cool. But we also have this here: splendid specimens of tattooed skin from an Irish American died at 29 years old. He'd been operated on by his brother when a boy from four to seven years of age, when the process of tattooing had occupied nearly three years. Um, and it says here, you can see, right, the specimen was presented to the Museum of, of the University of Edinburgh by Dr. J. Bigham. Now, I've been working on this stuff a long time. I've also got a friend called Gemma Angel at the University of Leicester who works on tattooed skins specifically. And we've never heard of this specimen or seen it. So we, I presumed it was uh, lost or destroyed a long, very long time ago. I messaged Gemma, I said, have you heard of this? She said, no. Uh, but so I emailed the University of Edinburgh and said, um, I know this doesn't exist anymore, but have you got papers of maybe where it went or maybe who it's from? Like, who is this Irish American boy? Uh, and the curator got back to me about a day later and went, oh no, it's in the back of the stores, so we'd forgotten about it. <laughs> so for 130 years, this had been sitting um, until I sent an email for someone to go and look for it. Um, it's basically, yeah, uh, certainly a kind of very great example of like traditional pre-professional or early professional 19th century American tattooing, um, purportedly, as I said, done on this, on this kid by his brother who was learning to tattoo. You, you wouldn't want to practice on um, paying customers, right? So you could practice it. It's absolutely incredible. So we've got the full, this is probably the guy's back and side and then we've got like his front here with the back of his neck. So we've got like little Venus here. There's a George Washington bit of, bit of Michelangelo. Um, all of this stuff, yeah. So that was quite a nice find in Edinburgh. But it also tells you, in a way, the reason that was co co collected, yes, to kind of, you know, show off to your mates in the anatomical society, but also it's because increasingly people believed in the late 19th century that the act of tattooing was because they'd forgotten forgotten that it had ever happened in Europe. Tattooing was indicative of savagery or primitivism, and therefore people who had tattoos were more like savages than they were civilised white people, right? So all of this stuff intersects in a really problematic way. God, I'm really running out of time. Okay, so um, all of that gets us to a professional tattoo industry um, in about the 1880s. Um, there's a whole other story about the long tail of this that goes back a little bit earlier on, um, and particularly in America. But really, we start seeing like professional tattoo studios for the general public in a way we recognise it today um, in the 1880s. Primarily, uh, most prominently, although again, not exactly the first person to do it, this guy, Sutherland MacDonald, who I love a lot. Um, he was tattooing in the Hammam Turkish Baths in German Street. And basically the reason that tattooing became a professional industry is because rich people wanted to get tattooed. So tattooing had been going on for centuries um, amongst people. Surely, the, yeah, I'm sure there was some tra trading going on and people were kind of, you know, getting paid in their intimate uh, communities for tattoo marks. But it really took rich people wanting to get tattooed for it to be a worthwhile business. McDonald had been running the baths as the bathhouse manager for some years. Um, he'd, he'd learned to tattoo in the army. And um, Japan was opened up to the West, um, after a couple of centuries of isolation, one of the things that people saw when they went there was the amazing tattooing in Japan. And they, some of them got tattooed there, members of you know, the royal family. Um, the Duke of Edinburgh, for example, in, eight, in 1869 was tattooed in Edinburgh, in, um, in uh, Yokohama. Uh, every royal visitor to Japan until the 1920s was tattooed in Japan. And lots of very wealthy travelers, members of the aristocracy, etc., cetera, um, who could afford to travel, got tattooed in Japan. And so when they came home and showed their mates, their mates said, where did you get that done? They said, Japan. It was difficult. Um, so local tattooers started, who'd learned to tattoo, um, as I said, in the army or the navy or just on their own kind of in, uh, interest, realized there was money to be made here um, to tattoo people who wanted tattoos but couldn't be bothered to go to Japan. So um, McDonald claimed, for example, he didn't, I don't think he tattooed any of these people, by the way. This is just boasting and claiming. There was news, most of these people, uh, including, for example, the King of England, King George V, um, 
had been known, publicly known, and verifiably known to be tattooed in Japan. Not much evidence of any of them getting tattooed again when they came home, but um, it was good business to go, well, yeah, when they came home, I, got another, I gave them another one. So this helped McDonald cultivate a kind of upper middle class client base of members of the House of Lords, actors, minor royalty, all that kind of stuff. Um, and he was doing like work like this. Um, so this is from about 1899. Um, so there are tattooers who work now who can't tattoo this well, by the way. It's 120 years ago. Um, tattooing copies of salon paintings. Um, so this is actually a copy of a painting by the French artist William Adolphe Bougereau. Um, or uh, religious iconography. This is, again, a copy of a painting. Um, check out that neck vein shading. Um, absolutely incredible work. Uh, he became known as the Michelangelo of tattooing. Um, but also principally Japanese designs, right, because of this cultural trend. So um, copying quite directly designs from people like uh, Hokusai and Kuniyoshi. So, for example, this is a tattoo that he did um, with this incredible negative space shade mount, shaded Mount Fuji in about 1900, based uh, in part on this Hokusai design. Um, MacDonald was developing mach new machines. He was the first... British person to have a patent for a tattoo machine. He was developing new inks. Um, he claimed that only a good yellow eluded him. Like he, he tried so many yellows that he was cutting them out of his skin because it was toxic. Um, created a very nice environment to get tattooed. Lots of kind of low lighting and sort of music. Um, he did inject cocaine into your tattoo site if you wanted um, to numb the pain. One journalist said, "Oh, I didn't, um, I didn't plan on getting tattooed, but uh, the, the tattooist said I should get it, and it felt really good." Uh, the cocaine, no shit. Um, and particularly, again, like engaging as tattooing as part of this visual cultural trend that is part of this broader cultural conversation around Japan. So um, everything Japanese became popular, right? Ceramic wear, uh, clothing, furniture, silverware. And like, I'm writing a thing at the moment about this little frog, originally from Hokusai. This is on a ceramic wear plate from France. Uh, called the Service Russo. Uh, and here it is as a tattoo by MacDonald. And here it is supposedly tattooed on the arm of Princess of Tech, who is the uh, king's brother in law. So, uh, I think. Um, the other thing that's happening really interestingly is that Japanese tattooing itself is changing. Um, I talk a lot about kind of cultural importation from Japan, but Japanese tattooers were tattooing European sailors who were now able to go to Japan. And I, uh, this is from 1908, a tattooed sketchbook that I saw in Nagasaki um, recently. And it has very traditional Japanese designs, like dragons and this kind of new guy here, um, which I've now got tattooed a copy of on my leg. But these guys were also developing European-style tattoos for Europeans. Um, so, again, even these stories of like cultural appropriation or cultural exchange are much more complicated and bilateral than they are often thought to be. Um, this started a whole industry. Um, some of the tattooers weren't as good as McDonald. This is a guy called, uh, <laughs> a guy called Alf South, um, who was tattooing on the Strand, amongst other places. Um, he was still advertising in quite high-end places. This actual advert was in Tatler magazine, right? Um, the, the kind of high society magazine. McDonald and some, some other London tattooers um, advertised in places like Sporting Times and Country Life and Badminton and Horse magazine. Um, they advertised in the programme at the Crufts Dog Show as well, for example. Um, but South had a bit of a less blue-blooded client base than McDonald did, and you, know, you can see he wasn't quite as good. On the left uh, is a painting by John uh, Nettleship, uh, who was a kind of commercial artist from the cover of a Boy's Own magazine. Uh, and then here, the sort of sad, quite limp copy of it, um, sadly on the arm. You get, you get what you pay for, kids. <laughs> um, and then finally, this is from, um, from Gemma's research. Um, we, we didn't at this time have a, have a real concept of like flash today. Lots of tattoos, including McDonald in particular, were, were using Print sources, again, this idea, as I, as I talked about in the 18th century, that designs would move from print to handicrafts to visual culture and various kinds and kind of circulate around. Tattooing is not separate from its surroundings. Um, this is another piece of tattooed preserved skin, this time from France. 
um, dating from before 1920. Uh, it had been written about by some um, French criminologists and prison guys who'd be like, look, this guy has his daughter tattooed on his heart because he loves her so much. It's a really intimate portrait of his daughter. And then Gemma found a picture of it. It's actually from a baby food ad. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can imagine the tattooers collecting these stuff, putting them into books, creating scrapbooks that would be the kind of precursors of modern-day flash designs. But this starts to complicate. I mean, again, I'm sure this guy could did and could have done attached very deep and meaningful uh, narratives to this particular tattoo. But at the same time, if you overdetermine tattooing as this kind of particularly deep and spiritual thing, and only that, and doesn't, don't give space for things like this, you miss tattooing's connection to everything else. Okay. Um, I'll finish up with just a section, section on George Bush. I've got a lot, I could do probably four talks here, but um, I'll finish up um, with what happens next. So after the Victorian period, things get a bit, um, a bit less uh, trendy. You know, the, the upper classes start to lose interest, and tattooing becomes smaller, cheaper, quicker, and more populist, if you like. Um, and the sort of spiritual successor, I suppose, to Burchett, is, uh, to um, McDonald, is this guy George Burchett. So I want to show you this uh, newsreel footage of him from about 100 years ago. It's actually from about 1932. This ought to be called tattooing the peach, because that's what Mr. George Burchett is doing. We used to think that only sailors patronized the art, but ladies have found its uses too. After all, what's more permanent than tattooed eyebrows? We used to think that only sailors one knows where to draw the, the line. And to reduce the lipstick bill, why not tattooed lips? It doesn't taste and it won't come off. And perhaps that's the drawback. After all, a change of color is desirable sometimes, like the girl who wore green lipstick when she went out with a traffic cop. But Mr. Burchett's real artistry is in figure work, and one of the most popular designs among the ladies is the Chinese dragon. They say that gentlemen prefer St. George. And now we know what the Sergeant Major meant when he shouted, show a leg, and he wasn't thinking of a military tattoo either. Now, gentlemen, Keep your eyes open on the beach this summer. You never know your luck. And by the way, I want you to know, the lady has a charming smile. So, so you know it's like that cliche 100 years ago, right? Like, oh, turns out women are getting tattooed now. Um, but Burchett considers himself to be a fine artist, or at least presents himself in that way. Um, producing stuff that was much smaller scale than anything that McDonald was doing, but um, nevertheless interesting. Um, working again, lots uh, uh, often on female customers, and um, you know, right through his career. So this is probably from about 1910. This is right up near his death in the 1950s. Um, newspapers are always interested in like tattooed women, right? <laughs> and. Um, Permanent makeup, as you saw there, um, rouging of cheeks. In fact, he had a separate studio just to tattoo permanent makeup on Piccadilly uh, rather than his normal shop, which was on Waterloo. So he had a shop for four sailors near the um, train station and near this Union Services Club, but also a separate kind of parlour almost for more um, refined kinds of tattooing. Um, his wife uh, was, as he said, his biggest and best canvas. This is Edith. But... Um, Let's skip this. Uh, he was, yeah, advertising himself as like society tattooist in the 1910s. So, again, if you've had this idea that tattooing is like just got trendy or, um, you know, used to be one kind of thing, actually, that used to be was always alongside something that's a bit more complicated and a bit more um, upbeat. Now, I said this, uh, I've been giving versions of this talk for a long time. And uh, a long time ago, uh, Morag, who's in the room, who was a tattooer from Edinburgh, came to one of my early talks, and she said, don't tell people that posh people used to get tattooed, because I only make money because young people think tattooing's cool. <laughs> uh, and tattooing is cool, but not just for sailors, right? Um, so, uh, you can see, yeah, like, you know, these two kind of uh, business cards. One, the society tattooist with tattoo removal, uh, and then uh, alongside the um, more sort of public-orientated stuff, including 
selling tattoo machines. So you could pop in and buy yourself a tattoo machine to go home and practice for yourself, if that was what you're into. Um, I think uh, I will finish up with a couple of quick stories. Um, one of this guy. Don't really know much about him, actually, but it's a good illustration of, again, the kind of, kind of work that we're doing at the moment with tattoo history, because aside from the archival lens, this idea that if academics go looking for tattooing, you only find it in lists of sailors and soldiers. There's also, most tattooing in history uh, in European culture has been done under clothing, right? So it was invisible. And so tattooing like this, probably from the 1950s, maybe a little bit earlier, um, and there are examples earlier, in fact, um, basically would have been invisible to people. Um, and we have examples of people uh, who are entirely tattooed around their basically their kind of bikini region, if you like, their kind of trunks region. You wouldn't know they were tattooed unless you saw them naked, but if you saw them naked, you'd see, like, how tattooed they really were. Um, and, of course, like, that leads to there also some of these perpetuations of stereotypes about sailors and criminals, because um, if your king has tattoos or your bank manager has tattoos, they're not going to be rolling up their sleeves or certainly weren't going to be in the early part of the 20th century. Um, however... The people that were digging the roads, who have their shirts off, working outside on the hot summer's day, if they had tattoos, they're the kind of tattoos that, normal, that everyone else would see. And that leads to this idea that only those kind of people have tattoos because the other kinds of tattooing was not visible. That includes tattooing on subcultures, tattooing particularly in gay communities. Um, all kinds of tattooing is, has been long invisible to um, mainstream cultural conversation. Um, and so that... That kind of visibility problem, this idea that tattooing, uh, lots of tattooing happened, for example, during World War II, but um, after the war, much of it was covered up. Also, tattooing uh, got very stigmatized with its uh, associations with, for example, the forced tattooing of um, uh, people forcibly taken to Auschwitz. Although even tattooers in London, like Birchett, made a living removing them. Um, interestingly enough, there was also tattooing in Germany. I had to include this, and this is where I'm going to finish. I had to include this because, because of where we are in the, in the, in the um, physicians. Uh, this is actually a German tattooer. So tattooing was very much not, um, not the done thing in uh, Hitler's Germany. And so there became a bit of a booming business for tattoo removal. Uh, this guy, Christian Wallich, uh, developed a secret sauce which he could put on your skin, uh, wrap it up, leave it for a few days, you come back and you'd be able to peel the tattoo off in one piece. So you can see, like, this preserves the tattoo as a single skin specimen. Um, that recipe was thought lost. Varlik kept it secret so that people would have to come to him if they wanted it done. And he didn't, as far as we knew, tell anyone uh, when he died. However, another tattoo historian, a friend of mine, Ole Whitman, found in the Nazi archives in Germany um, a description. Because one of his patients is went septic. And so the Nazi sort of health official turned up and said, what's going on here? And Varlik gave him the recipe, which is a particular mix of kind of solvents and other, other kind of chemicals. Um, and they recorded that for posterity. And so Ole, a couple of years ago, was able to recreate this technology. They tested it out, not on themselves, but on pigs, tattooed pigskin, and it does work pretty well. <laughs> um, so um, all of which is to say, thank you very much. <laughs>